Today I'll be reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timothus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our laborer be in vain. But now when Timothus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. God bless the readers and doers of his word. Amen. I don't have social media. I can't check them on WhatsApp. So I only have Timothy. I have to send Timothy to them. Timothy, go and find out what is happening to them because I can't, I can't forbear it anymore. I, I, I'm just concerned. And what he's concerned about, if you read the scripture carefully, what he's concerned about is not whether the persecution has killed them. He's concerned about whether the persecution has affected their faith. That's what the issue is. Not whether, oh, the persecution, they threw them in prison. Of course, that would be concerning. Or they killed them. Of course, that would be concerning. But what concerning to Paul was the status of their faith on account of persecution. And that is the question the church in America would have to answer very soon. When persecution is, when persecution escalates, the church would have to examine her faith because many will compromise in order to soften, to cushion the effect of the persecution. Verse 5. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith. That's all. He didn't send to know how you are doing. I didn't, he didn't send to say, oh, how are you doing? Have you eaten bread today? No. Oh, how are you doing? Did you um, drink water today? No. He couldn't forbear, so he sent Timothy to know your faith. Lest by some means the tempter, that is Satan, has tempted you. Tempted you to do what? No, I know your faith. Because of persecution. And our labor be in vain. So, there is this persecution that is coming. And the reason that it is coming is because, catch this, the church has been given a mandate to fulfill a great commission. So, the primary assignment of the church is the great commission. Saving of souls and bringing them into the kingdom. So, Satan knows that that is the assignment given to the church. So, he has to persecute the church so that the church will not be able to fulfill its assignment. So that the church will be distracted from fulfilling that assignment. So Paul is very concerned about the faith of the church in Thessalonica. Verse 7, I jump to verse 7 because of time. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction, in all our affliction and distress by your faith. Not by the reason that you were alive, by your faith. In other words, even though the church in Thessalonica was persecuted beyond measure, they did not compromise their faith. And a time is coming when the church in America will be put to that test. The time, if I dare say, is round about, round about the corner. Now let's go to Matthew, the book of Matthew, chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is talking about persecution. Matthew 5, I begin with verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. So it's not just being persecuted, but it must be persecuted for righteousness' sake. So if you're being persecuted on account of your evil deeds, this blessing does not cover you. This is a blessing, a beatitude for those that are persecuted on account of righteousness. 
Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Why would they be rewarded with the kingdom of heaven? Because in spite of their persecution, they did not compromise their faith. Just like the church in Thessalonica. But you know, if we go through a level of persecution, and that is why the Bible says, what is it that puts his trust in man? If we go through a level of persecution, and we start to compromise our faith, fellow believers will tell you, oh, come on, I understand. You know, I understand, you know, it's a lot. You understand, but God does not understand. So when you look to man, man will give you a pass. Man will give you a free pass. And then you miss this blessing. It says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11, Matthew 5, verse 11. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. So they are not just persecuting you, they are persecut persecuting you for the sake of Christ. So it's not like they are saying all manner of evil falsely against you to get a job. It doesn't apply. Oh, they are persecuting you because they want to get this opportunity. They don't want you to get the opportunity. That's different. But this is talking about for the sake of Christ. You're being persecuted for the sake of Christ. Christians are quick to say, oh, I'm being persecuted at work. My supervisor is persecuting me at work. And you might not be, being, you might not be persecuted at work for the sake of Christ. Maybe it's because you come late. Or you're always taking coffee break and bathroom breaks. That might be why. But this blessing is for those that are persecuted, reviled for the sake of Christ. And then he tells them in verse 12, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. I'm being persecuted. How can I rejoice and be exceedingly glad? Ah. The natural human instinct, the flesh, is to complain. My first instinct will be to complain. Oh, this is not fair. Lord, I pay my tithe, I give offering, I help the poor, I go to the homeless shelters, I visit the prisons, I help people. How can this happen to me? So the first instinct of the church would be to complain. Jesus says, don't. Rather than complain, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. And that will confuse your persecutors. There are many persecutors that have come to Christ based on the reaction of the person they were persecuting. They were persecuting people so inhumanely, and yet those people were loving them regardless. He says, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. So persecution is geared to making you heavenly minded. Did he say great is your reward on earth? He hasn't promised you any reward on earth. Christ has not promised us any reward on earth. All he has told us that in, on earth we will have trouble. All he has told us on earth is that if you suffer with me, what is suffer? Persecution. If you suffer with me, you will reign with me. We are on earth? In heaven. In heaven. So, here, yeah, Persecution makes us heavenly minded. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Which were before you. So persecu persecution did not start with you. It did not start with you. Now, They would, Satan would always use men to persecute the church because the gospel is a gospel of light and this is a kingdom of darkness. So people will persecute you because the light shines in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. They are going to persecute you when you tell them that gay marriage is evil. 
They will say you are intolerant. They are going to persecute you when you say, you know what? This marijuana they are making legitimate is a, is a mood altering drug and it's not good for the soul. You are abusing the temple of the Holy Spirit. They are going to persecute you. They are going to persecute you when you raise up a standard against abortion. Why, why are they persecuting you? Why are they calling you all manner of things? Some men will revile you for my name's sake. Why are they reviling us? It's because we carry the light of the gospel. We are different. We are set apart. We were brought out from them, out of darkness, into this marvelous light. Oh, man. Do not expect the children of Satan to clap for you. Now, we'll see this uh, more clearly in the book of Esther. If you remember, the Jews were being persecuted under Mordecai. If we can go to the book of Esther, chapter 3, I begin with verse 8. Now, and Haman said unto the king, Ahasuerus, there is a certain people. He's trying to tell the king the people he wants to persecute. There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom. The reason they are scattered abroad is because God scattered them on account of their disobedience. They used to be in one place before in Israel. But God scattered them because of their disobedience. So now, Haman is telling the king that there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all people. Now, they don't have power to make law. They are vassals. So the law it is talking about is their way of living, their customs. So, and their laws are diverse from all people. Neither keep they the king's laws. They don't keep the king's laws because they worship only one God. Therefore, it is not for the king's prophets to suffer them, to allow them to exist. So, here is an advisor to the king, advising the king to persecute all the Jews because it's unprofitable to keep them. That's nice. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. There are people right now that want to destroy Christians. But we are so naive, we think everybody like Christians. We are some Islamic fundamentalists that are ready to destroy all Christians if you give them the opportunity. But the Holy Spirit will restrain them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business. In other words, king, you don't have to finance it. I will finance it from my own money. I will sponsor the people that will persecute the Christians. There are Organizations today that persecute Christians, like Boko Haram. They are being sponsored by somebody. So they are going to. America is going to see the spot of persecution, the financing of persecution. And they will be wondering who is financing these people? Where do they get their money from to attack the church like this? Where do they get their money from to. to um, make adverts on prime time against the church to spread their message against the church. So he says, I will finance it. I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. I will do it. I will pay it myself. Let's move on this thing. And the king took his ring from his hand. He didn't even think about it. He didn't even examine it. The king didn't even say, oh, why don't you give me some time to go over it and know more about this thing? He didn't do that. He didn't do that. People don't care and they don't want to know. Just get rid of them. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto him and the son of Amadatha, the Agadites, the Jews' enemy. And 
Then the king is the sovereign. And he took his ring, that's a symbol of authority, and he gave it to Haman. Just like the, prod, the son of the prodigal father took his ring and gave it to the prodigal son. So here is the king, the sovereign, giving his authority, transferring his authority to Haman to persecute the Jews. We all know the, the, the sovereign power in America and in other places. And it would be naive for you to think that that sovereign power is concerned about the welfare of the church. I'm not a politician. I'm not a politician. But it would be naive to think that the sovereign power is concerned about the welfare of the church. He will only use the church to get to where he wants to get to. I don't care what they're saying now. That is what they will do. And the king said unto Haman, The silver is given to thee, the people also, to do with them as a seemed good to thee. So this is the enemy of the Jews, and the king is empowering him to do what he sees best. So can you imagine the Jews who are complaining to the king? The king will listen to them. Or they go complain to Haman. They go report Haman to the king, not knowing that the king has Haman's back. Haman has, uh, the king has the back of Haman. And the same thing is going on behind the scenes in America. The Jews were comfortable not knowing that an adversary was working their death warrant. And it took the Spirit of God walking through Queen Esther to deliver them from extermination. There are powers that want to exterminate the church. But Jesus has said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. So why is God allowing persecution? The Bible told us in 1 Thessalonians, we looked at it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, that this is these afflictions are preordained. Jesus says in this world, you will have trouble. So why would, why would the Lord permit this? Now, in the book of Acts chapter 8, let's look at something quickly in Acts chapter 8. The Acts of the Holy Spirit or the Acts of the Apostles. Acts chapter 8. Let's start with verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death, that's the death of Stephen. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. So at that time, there was, does that say there was a persecution? Yeah. A great persecution. You know, this is not ordinary persecution. It's on a different level. So at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So persecution hit the church in Jerusalem. And because of that persecution, they were scattered abroad. If not, they would have congregated in Jerusalem. And sometimes we tend to congregate in Jerusalem. Meanwhile, Jesus Christ told them in Acts chapter 1 that you will be my witnesses in all of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. But this is a church that was comfortable congregating in Jerusalem. So persecution came, great persecution came, and they were all scattered abroad, except the apostles. The apostles refused to leave Jerusalem. They remained in spite of the persecution. Let's jump to verse 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. That is persecution right here. You know what this will make havoc of the church? That means we have to meet at 7 p.m. We cannot. So just are already at the door. We have to meet on, on, on Sunday at 10 a.m. We cannot. The cops have sealed up the place. Or we come into the church, they're picking all our chairs. So they, they're picking the pastor, they're taking the deacons, they're picking the apostles. 
to erect havoc on the church. That's persecution. And then entering into every house of believers and hailing hell, men and women, committing them to prison. <laughs> In the time preceding President Trump, the Church of God narrowly escaped, narrowly escaped the exercise of sovereign power that wanted the church to lose its non-profit status if it refuses to recognize gay marriage. The evangelist at the back was with me at 2136 Fulton Street on a Sunday afternoon. It was with me when two lesbian women came to the church and demanded that I marry them in Obama's time. So I'm not making this story up. He was there. And I knew the pressure the church was going through. And what did I say to them? I said, come for premarital counseling. I didn't tell them yes, I didn't tell them no. I said, come from the marital council. So that was the exercise of sovereign power against the doctrines of the church. And if care is not taken, we are entering into an era where we will see more of that. And let me make it clear. It's not about Republicans or Democrats. It's about the times. It's the signs of the times. It has nothing to do with blue party or red party. I'm not here to endorse any party. It's the sign of the times. Even if your candidate gets there, whoever he is or she is, even if your candidate gets there, the signs of the times will tie the hand of your candidate that your candidate will not be able to do what you are expecting your candidate to do. Who is it that put his trust in man? So, so, red havoc on the church. But it doesn't end there. Let's go to verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. So let's say hallelujah. If they were not scattered abroad, they won't go everywhere preaching the world. That is how the gospel spread. That means that what Satan meant for evil through the hand of Saul, God worked it and turned it around for the good of the gospel. Amen. So then they were scattered abroad, went about preaching the world. So there's a persecution that is coming to America, and that's why I said initially that it is, that persecution is coming to jolt the church, to shake the church, so that we can the, the spirit of God can sift the dross from the silver and make the church more effective to advance God's kingdom. Amen. We are still playing. The truth be told, we are still playing. We are still playing. We are like the church in Laodicea. We are like the church in Laodicea. But Jesus is not going to spit us out from his mouth. He's going to bring a fire. Mm. A baptism of fire. A fire that will make the church sit up. You know, I come from a country that is like half Christian, half Muslim. It's the only country in the world like that. Nigeria is the only country in the world like this. Every other country has either predominantly Muslim or predominantly Christian. It's the only country where the population of Christians and Muslims are apart. Indonesia is not like that. Saudi Arabia is not like that. Iran is not like that. No other country is like that. And most of the Muslims are in the north. So all the persecution against the church in Nigeria is in the north. The south is predominantly Christian. So guess which church in Nigeria is more powerful? The church in the north or the church in the south? Church in the, north. the church in the north. Because the church in the south is comfortable. 
Nobody persecutes them. They can walk to church on Sunday, they can smile and go to church on Sunday, but in the north, when they are going to church, it is war. Sometimes they go to church with their 1847 and Bible. So there is a persecution that is coming that will jolt the church from its comfort zone. And then you will see the church, when it is scattered, they will start to preach like they've never preached before. Amen. Amen. Let's jump quickly to Ephesians 3, verse 20, familiar scripture. Ephesians. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. So, if God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think, what makes us think that he doesn't have this persecution in his hands. Mm. He got this. Now, the <laughs> purpose of persecution is twofold. It's twofold. It's to destroy the church or to get the saints to compromise. Mm -hmm. It brings in a spirit of compromise. So I said, you know what? Hey, we can coexist. Come on. You know. You do for me, I do for you. The problem is that when I do for you, I'm compromising the gospel. Mm -hmm. So he is able to do exceeding abundantly. If we know that and we truly know that, then when the persecution comes and it's already at our doorstep, we should not be shaken. Yes. We should not be shaken. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, let's um let's move on. Let's jump to Second Timothy chapter three. Are we following? Yes. So when we are persecuted, what are we to do? Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Well, that's not our first response. That's not the response of the flesh. Okay, let's jump to 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 11. Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch. Everybody is tired today. No. Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. So not only in one place. Everywhere the man go, persecution. So, He's talking about the persecution he experienced in three different places. Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions are endured? If you're complaining about something, you're not enduring it. Because if you complain about it, you come on, endure. So he says, what persecutions are endured? In other words, when Paul was at Antioch, when he was at Iconium, when he was at Lystra, and he said, Hey, Paul, how are you doing? He said, Oh, thanks, I'm doing very well. Thank you. How are you? In other words, he doesn't say, Oh, they're on my back. Pray for me. Blah, 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 blah. He rejoiced. I've been exceedingly good. Mm. You know, sometimes our prayer request is complaints. We don't have to do it in a way that the complaint becomes a prayer request. So persecutions, afflictions which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Amen. Jesus will deliver his church. Amen. But sometimes he will choose to raise matters for the church. Yea, verse 12, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Let's look at that. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus may suffer persecution. Oh. Guaranteed. At one point or the other, guaranteed. If the persecution doesn't come from the government, it will come from your family. It don't come from your family, it will come from those you think are your friends. And God will allow that persecution to refine you. It's a refiner's fire. 
So it's refining the church. So all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. These are the people that are persecuting us. Yeah, these are the people that are persecuting us. They're not good men. They're evil men. And the seducers to get us to compromise. To seduce us to compromise. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Deceiving and being deceived. So they're going to get worse. And if they are waxing worse and worse, that tells us that the persecution is getting worse and worse. But look at verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. Somebody say continue. continue. So in spite of the fact that the evil men are getting worse and worse, continue. When persecution comes, people stop. They don't continue in Christ. This I didn't sign up for this. This is too much. I'm the, only, I'm the only son of my mother. I'm the only child of my parents. I don't want to die. My parents will have a heart attack. He said, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. The faith. And has been assured of. The faith. Knowing of whom thou hast learned from. Continue. Don't, you know, if I'm going like this, continuing in this direction. But if I start to do this, no longer continue in that direction. I change. So he says, don't change. Continue means don't change. Keep going in the same direction we taught you. Because once you change, it's compromise. You change because you're trying to please somebody. It's what why why we don't continue when there's persecution is either because of the fear of man. The desire to please man. man. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. So the people that are not prepared are the people that don't know the word of God. So the persecution takes them by surprise. Mm -hmm. It takes them by surprise. When you give your life to Jesus, are you really, really sure you're giving your life to Jesus? Because if you give your life to Jesus, that means Jesus can demand your life. Yeah. And the Bible says the last fear to be conquered is the fear of death. <laughs> Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. <laughs> so when you really give your life to Jesus, bear in mind that he may demand your life at any time. And when he demands your life, then the truth will be revealed as to whether you really gave your life to him. Amen. Let's jump to Revelation chapter 6. We're looking at the gospel and persecution. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they had. So the reason they were slain was because of the word of God and the testimony they professed. That's the reason why they were slain. So when the fifth seal was open, he saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain because of this. They could have escaped it. They could have renounced the word of God. They could have renounced the testimony they held on to and escaped death. But eventually you will die one day. So all these souls are under the altar. These are faithful souls. Let's move on to this thing. And they cried with a loud voice. Persecution is painful. Say, how long, O oh Lord, holy and true, Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? 
You know, how long would you allow them to go scot free in this manner? Would you bring them to account? How long? We are killed and we've not gotten justice. Verse 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season. Someone say for a little season. For a little season. Yeah, just for a little season. Until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. In other words, it's been preordained that other people are going to be killed. So he says, chill. Chill for a little season. Until the others come and join you under the altar. Okay. You would think the prayers would be, oh Lord, prevent others from joining us here. <laughs> Lord, go and save them, rescue them. God will not answer that prayer because these are predetermined fixed things to usher in the second coming of Christ. Right. So it says, rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Hmm. And the question becomes, as I close, is the church ready for the wave of persecution that is coming? When that wave of persecution comes, we will know those who have oil in their lamps. <laughs> Right now, it looks like everybody has, everybody is carrying a lamp. <laughs> we all have lamps. But when that persecution comes, we know those that have oil in their lamp. I pray we will all have oil in our lamp. Amen. That the Spirit of God will give us the grace to stand. Now, we saw how the church in Jerusalem was able to spread the gospel through persecution. There are many stories in the Bible where God has used persecution for his glory. Mm. See how they persecuted the Jews in Babylon and they took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and put them in a fiery furnace. That is the level of persecution. And God used that to showcase his glory. The book of God said, ah, wasn't it three people we threw into the fire? I see a fourth man as the son of God. So God will use that persecution to showcase his glory. I once had this um, supervisor when I worked for the city of New York. I was in the investigation department before I moved to the legal department. I was waiting for my um, call to bar papers, to, admission to the bar papers to be um, put in place. I was working in the investigation department and I had this very big supervisor. At this age, I was about 28, so about 29, 28, 29 years old. It's very mean supervisor. And I make this boast. Where I work, if you went to where I work and you say you're looking for one Christian, they'll call me. Amen. They'll call me. I was in the pastor and I was like, they will call me. Everybody knew I was a Christian. Amen. In fact, some of them when they say, oh, you give me a track already, you give me a track already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing. <laughs> Work on Sundays. Everybody knows I don't work. He said, From now on, you're working on Sundays. No problem. Now he found out that I was in a church where they had prayer meeting on Tuesday. He said, You will not be working Tuesday night. My partner said, This is your thing. So I had a partner. He said, You know what? You will take your break at 7 p.m to 8 p.m. So at least you can have one hour of your service. And this man will try and make sure I don't take my break between that time. It was so bad. 
get my coat. And then he moved to NYPD. The guy moved to NYPD. So long as that guy was there, I could not rise. So he moved to NYPD. As soon as he moved to NYPD, in less than two months, I was promoted. Amen. As soon as that guy moved, as the Lord is my witness, I got six promotions in seven years. Wow. But I had to go through that persecution so that those above me could see my character. To see my character. Even when they said, oh, let's take him to the EEO. He said, no. Why are we taking him to the EEO? So there's that kind of persecution that we come. And I'm not saying that to say I'm a hero. Don't get me wrong. So there's that kind of persecution that will come. It will be like you're, on, you're working on, on, on pins and needles. You just have to trust God. The Bible says in Romans 8 verse 28, he says, and we know that all things work together for the good of those that love him, that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So even in the persecution, he's working together for our good. Amen. Now there's a problem I want to address before I close this message. There is persecution coming to the church. But there's a problem in the church. A a, a chronic problem in the church. And the chronic problem in the church is that members of the church, the saints, are persecuting their fellow saints. Mm -hmm. So the persecution is not even coming from outside. It's coming from within. And the reason why it is so, and these are Christians, they are not um, unbelievers, they are not fake. They are real Christians and they are persecuting their fellow Christians. And the reason why this is so is because they are in the flesh. They still have jealousy, they still have envy, they still have attitude that they don't surrender to the Holy Spirit. So you see fellow Christians joining hand with unbeliever to persecute another Christian. And this persecution always has to be, the persecution we're talking about always has to be for righteousness sake. Yeah. For the sake of Christ. So, we brought the spirit of the world into the church. And the spirit of worldliness is enmity with God. So the spirit of the world is comfortable in the church and that's why you see a divided church with persecution. Said persecuting saints. Pentecostal persecuting evangelicals. Evangelicals persecuting um, Episcopalians. And I hate to say it, it's going to get. You will remember I said this. And you don't have to be a prophet to know this, just be a student of history. It's going to get nasty when we get closer to the elections. Then we see Christians insulting Christians. Then we see Christians say, you know what? They're not a Christian. Because you're voting for the red flag or because you're voting for the blue flag. I see Jesus is a Republican. I see Jesus is a Democrat. I see Jesus is an independent. Calm down. Our kingdom is out of this world. It is not. So it's going to get nasty. You will see all manner of persecution within the church. And what did Jesus say? He said, A time will come, John chapter 16, verse 2 or 3, when they will kill you and they will think they're doing God themselves. And they will think they're doing God themselves. They will think they're doing the right thing. But meanwhile, they are persecuted. So, while it is appointed for us to go through persecution, we must make sure that we are not persecuting others. 
As a Christian, you're not called to persecute non-Christians. We don't share the gospel like that. Some other religions do that. That's how they spread their, their, their faith, the tenets of their faith. We don't do that. We're not called to persecute one another, and we're not called to persecute our enemies. We're actually called to bless them. So, church, that wave is coming, and we got to be strong. Amen. And without your knowing, and perhaps you know, God has been training you already for this time. Amen. The trials you've been going through, those witchcraft attacks, He's been building your spiritual muscles so that when we get to the wave of persecution that is definitely appointed for the church, we will be able to rise. We're going to pray for the church of the living God. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift up the church of the of prayer. Lift up the body of Christ before you, Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, you said upon this rock you shall build your church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Lord, you have called your pride to be an army of the living God. Lord, you are raising up an end time army. Oh, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, Father, we dare to pray for our persecutors today. We don't trust them. Yes. Father, we pray that we open their eyes to see what we have seen. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Lord, we trust your judgment. Yes. We trust your will. Yes. We trust your decision. Yes, Whatever decision you make concerning the church, it is the right decision. Amen. And Lord, you have said that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Father, whatever the gates of hell are planning, Father, whatever they are doing in the dark, secret places, yes. Lord, say in the name of Jesus, yes. Lord, let the light of the gospel begin Amen. In the name of the gospel, Lord God, some persecuted the church. Yes. He said, I talk in the church. And the light of the gospel reached him. Father, we are praying that our persecutors will encounter the risen Christ Amen. on their way to their Damascus. They will encounter the living Jesus. But the people are telling you that I am a that the church will not compromise. We are praying for the church today, O God. That we will not be lukewarm. Amen. Find heart of gold. Amen. Father, we are praying that we will come back to our best love. Amen. In the name of Jesus. And where we have been distracted. Yes. My God, where we have been distracted. That we will put our eyes back on Jesus. Amen. That we will look unto Jesus regardless of our persecution. Amen. That we will look unto Christ regardless of our circumstances. Amen. Looking unto Jesus as the unto finisher and perfect of our faith. Amen. But there is a persecution that is coming that will attack the finances of the church. The persecution will be tied to the finances. Either through tax mechanism or whatever mechanism, my Lord and my God, you are the one that sent your disciple to go yes. to the river. Yes, Father. You said the first piece you can open his mouth, right? And you will see two coins, pay my hands and your dad. So, Lord, we know that you, oh God, will meet all the needs of the church according to your unlimited riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Yes. Father, when financial persecution will come. Yeah. Help us to remember that you own the temple of a thousand years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Help us to remember that the gold and the silver is yours, and all the animals in the forest are yours. Yeah, yeah. But the end is the Lord, and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. For he founded it upon the seas, and he established it upon the floors. Yeah. Don't help us to remember that you have the whole world in your hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, when persecution comes, and it seems, oh God, that our wells are running dry. Yes. We will look to you, the spring of living water, yes. to make a way for the church. Amen. Hallelujah. God strengthen us. Yes, Father. God strengthen the body of Christ. Yes, Father. Where there is division, we are so divided. Oh God, there are over 2,000 denominations of Christianity. Over 2,000 denominations. All professing the same Christ. Yes. My Lord and my God, we are so divided. Help us to be one. 
Amen. Just as you and the Father are one. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Father. <laughs> yes, Lord. Yes. Yes, Father. That your name will be glorified. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I was praying, the Spirit of God ministered to me. A kind is coming where just like the 24 elders that lay down their crown. You will see pastors laying down their crown. You will see apostles and bishops laying down their crown. The persecution will be too much for them. Oh it will be too, they will lay down their crown and worship Jehovah. But right now they're like, oh, I'm chief apostle, I'm the bishop, I'm the archbishop. Okay. When the persecution comes, we will know whether your title can save you. It's not the spirit of God. He says that they lay down their crown. Because it will be too hard for them to hold on to the crown. It's too hard for them to hold on to the crown. It can be come when if you just we will just be believers. Let it come. Let it come. That doesn't mean there's no authority in the house of God. That doesn't mean there's no structure of leadership. But the persecution will just bring us to the basics where they are believers. This time shall follow the that are believers. But I have given your word as best as I know. As best as I know, just as you've given it to me. Yes, Father. Lord, we thank you. Encourage us. Yes. Let us be encouraged by this word. Yes, Let us be prepared. Let us be prepared. We don't want to be like the five foolish virgins. That we will have oil in our lamp. We thank you, Father. Father, concerning the church, appoint watchmen. That we stand by the wall to we'll see the enemy coming from afar. Yeah. Our gatekeepers, these are gatekeepers in the body of Christ that we blow the ground, that we sound the trumpet before the enemy enters. For the enemy will enter, but he will not prevail. Amen. Thank you, man. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I will now call in the pastor of the house, Pastor Valiant. Please close us up. Pastor Valiant, please. Are you ready? Amen. Are you ready? Amen. Are you prepared? If you are not prepared, begin to prepare yourself tonight. Begin to seek his face, brethren. This is the time for us to draw more out of that well of living water. This is the time for us to cry more. This is the time for us to seek Jesus' face more. This is the time for us to dwell in his presence more. This is the time for you and I to pray even harder than we are always do. This is the time for us to read his word more. This is the time for us to get his word in our inner manner. As the man of God has given the word of God today, are you prepared in the name of Jesus? Are you prepared? Because it is certainly going to come. And when it comes, may you and I be found in the courts of the living God, like that great holy tree, giving praise and honor to Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. And just as the just as the persecution come, just as the children of Israel were scattered, may you and I be scattered to preach the gospel to the four corners of the earth in the name of Jesus. If you are not prepared by the power of the Holy Ghost, we are prepared, Holy Spirit. Use us to spread the word of God. For it is not in you that any should perish. Father, we thank you, our Father. We are ready, Lord God. We are ready that you use us as your instrument of light today. We are ready that you take us as sticking center to the world in the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. That you will cause me to end in Jesus' glorious name. Lord, we just thank you for your man, Sarah. Yes, 
that you have used it to bring life again into us. Some of us that are tired, some of us that are weak, some of us that are going through one pain or the other, you use the word of life today to jump us into reality in the name of Jesus Christ. That we are part of this world. We are part of this world. Is hidden in Christ Jesus with God. So, Father, move in us that are ready. Move in us today that we would spread the word of God Amen. to the four corners of the earth. Yes, Father, we thank you today yes. that you cause us to gather in your house today to receive, Lord God. Yes. Father, we thank you, oh Lord, as you have used your man servant, fill it again with your anointing to deliver. Fill him again with the authority to declare your word. Father, speak something to him today and give us life through him in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we cover him in the blood of Jesus. We cover the ministry of overcomers in Christ group of churches in the blood of Jesus. That on that day, Lord God, use overcomer to be a watchman for the house of God. We thank you all most high. In Jesus' mighty name we pray today. Amen. And now, let the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. And surely, God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise Jehovah.